Well, I'm very happy to welcome you all to the first of three uh, events in the light of this year's Cardinal Mercier Chair at KU Leuven. Um, the history of the Cardinal Mercier Chair can be traced back to 1952. And it was created with the intention of bringing the greatest philosophers of our time to Leuven in order for the students at KU Leuven to learn about the most original and exciting new contributions to our field. Uh, some philosophers that have held this position over the years include uh, Peter Strassen, Jacques Derrida, Hans-Georg Gadamer, uh, Stanley Cavell, John McDowell from Pittsburgh as well, uh, Christian Korsgaard and uh, Linda Zygzebski. Now I'm sure that the Dean of the Institute of, of Philosophy, um, Professor Geert van Riel, will tell a much more elaborate story about the rich history of this position later um, today before the public lecture at 5 p.m. And therefore, all that I can do now is to introduce to you for the very first time this, uh, this year's holder of the Cardinal Mercier Chair. Professor Robert Brandom is a distinguished professor of philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh and is without any doubt one of the greatest and most influential philosophers alive today. Um, he earned his PhD in 1977 uh, from Princeton University, where his supervisors were Richard Rorty and David Lewis. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, but Professor Brandom can correct me if I'm wrong, I think uh, I remember him saying that it was the only time uh, that Rorty and Lewis worked together as supervisor and co-supervisor for a PhD thesis. Uh, and in a sense, this rare synthesis of the different philosophical approaches of Lewis and Rorty would become a characteristic feature of the creativity and versatility of um, Brandom's philosophical project over the last decades. His 1994 masterpiece, Make It Explicit, um, was not only a landmark in the philosophy of language by developing a brand new theory of uh, of meaning called semantic inferentialism. It also contributed original ideas to the philosophy of mind, philosophy of action, philosophy of logic, and the history of philosophy. Uh, another example of this versatility is his uh, recently published A Spirit of Trust in 2019, which offers an interpretation of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirits, and the fact that he's currently working on a book in which he develops a new um, non-monotonic expressivist logic, which takes the ideas of his logical expressivism and his position in the philosophy of logic seriously. Um, so in Brandom's philosophical universe, and I would wholeheartedly recommend numerous visits to this universe, going from Hegel to the most recent developments in formal logic is just a small step. Um, in today's seminar, Professor Brandom will be talking about another giant of uh, 20th century philosophy, Wilfried Sellers who was Brandom's colleague at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and I think it is fair to say that it would be hard to find someone who is better placed to evaluate and further work out uh, the central ideas in Sellers' philosophy. All right, so I'm extremely delighted to now give the word to Professor Brandom, who will give a talk with the title Pragmatism, Inferentialism, and Modality in Sellers' Arguments Against Empiricism. Thank you very much, uh, Sebrin. In this talk, I want to place the arguments of Seller's masterwork, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, in the context of some of his other nearly contemporary articles and trace further into those neighboring works some strands of argumentation that intersect and are woven together in his critique of empiricism in its two principal then extant forms, traditional and 20th century logical empiricism. Sellers always accepted that observation reports playing, resulting non-inferentially from the exercise of perceptual language entry capacities play both the privileged epistemological role of being the ultimate court of appeal for the justification of empirical knowledge claims, and therefore, given his inferentialist semantics, an essential semantic role in determining the contents of the empirical concepts that are applied in such judgments. But in accord with his stated aspiration to move analytic philosophy from its Humean into its Kantian phase, Sellers was severely and in principle critical of empiricist ambitions and programs in epistemology and especially semantics 
that go beyond that minimal, carefully circumscribed characterization of the cognitive significance of sense experience. Indeed, I think the lasting philosophical interest of Seller's thought lies primarily in the battery of considerations and arguments that he brings to bear against all weightier forms of empiricism. Some, but not all of these, are deployed in the opening critical portions of empiricism and the philosophy of mind, where the ground is cleared and prepared for the constructive theorizing of the last half of that essay. But what's on offer there is only part of Seller's overall critique of empiricism. And we accordingly court misunderstanding of what is there if we don't appreciate the shape of the larger enterprise to which it contributes. In an autobiographical sketch, Sellers dates his break with traditional empiricism to his Oxford days in the 1930s. It was, he says, prompted by concern with understanding the sort of conceptual content that ought to be associated with logical, causal, and deontological modalities. Already at that point, he says he had the idea that what was needed was a functional theory of concepts, which would make their role in reasoning rather than their supposed origin and experience, their primary feature, end of that quote. This telling passage introduces two of the master ideas that shape Seller's critique of empiricism. The first is that a key criterion of adequacy with respect to which empiricist semantics will be found wanting concerns its treatment of modal concepts. The second is that the remedy for this inadequacy lies in an alternative, broadly functionalist approach to the semantics of those concepts that functions on their, that focuses on their inferential roles, as it were looking downstream to their subsequent use, as well as upstream to the circumstances and experience that elicit their application. That second, inferential functionalist semantic idea looms large in EPM. In fact, it provides the raw materials that are assembled and articulated into Seller's positive account of the semantics of the concepts applied in reporting thoughts and sense impressions. Concern with the significance of modality in the critique of empiricism, however, is almost wholly absent from that work. I don't think this was because it was not, even then, an essential element of the larger picture of empiricism's failings that Sellers was seeking to convey, but rather because it was the result of a hard-won but ultimately successful divide-and-conquer expository strategy. That is, I conjecture that what made it possible for Sellers finally to write empiricism in the philosophy of mind was figuring out a way to articulate the considerations he advances there without having also at the same time to explore the issues raised by empiricism's difficulties with modal concepts. Whether or not that conjecture about the intellectual biographical significance of finding a narrative path that makes possible a separation of these aspects of his project is correct, I wanna claim that it's still important to understand what goes on in empiricism and the philosophy of mind in the light of the fuller picture of the expressive impoverishment of empiricism that becomes visible when we consider what Sellers says when he does turn his attention to the semantics of modality. And there's a third strand to the rope with which Sellers first binds and then strangles the excessive ambitions of empiricism. And that's his methodological strategy of considering semantic relations among the meanings expressed by different sorts of vocabulary that result from pragmatic dependencies relating the practices one must engage in or the abilities one must exercise in order to count as using those bits of vocabulary to express those meanings. This is the pragmatist element in Seller's multi-front assault on empiricism. It makes a significant contribution to the early critical portion of EPM, although Sellers does not overtly mark it as he does the contribution of his inferential functionalism to the later, more constructive portion. The concern with what one must do in order to say various kinds of things remains implicit in what Sellers does rather than explicit in what he says about what he does. As we'll see, both the pragmatist and inferentialist ideas are integral to his critique of empiricist approaches to modality, 
and to his constructive suggestions for a more adequate treatment of modal vocabulary. I think of the classical project of analytic philosophy in the 20th century as being the exploration of how the meanings expressed by some target vocabularies can be exhibited as in some sense, a logical elaboration of the meanings already expressed in some base vocabularies. The conception of the desired semantic relation between vocabularies, that is the sense of analysis, varied significantly within this broadly defined semantic project. It included definition, paraphrase, translation, reduction in various senses, supervenience, and truth-making, just to name a few prominent candidates. I take it to be integral to the analytic philosophical project during this period, that however that semantic relation is conceived, logical vocabulary is taken to play a special role in elaborating the uncontroversial base vocabulary into the controversial or problematic target vocabulary. The distinctively 20th century form of empiricism can be understood as one of the core programs of that analytic project. In the sense that even those who reject it for some target vocabulary or other took the possibility of an empiricist analysis to be an important issue to set a legitimate philosophical agenda. Construed in these terms, 20th century empiricism can be thought of as having proposed three broad kinds of empiricist base vocabularies into which everything was to be translated or logically analyzed. The most restrictive kind comprises phenomenalist vocabularies, those that specify how things subjectively appear as opposed to how they objectively are, or the not yet conceptualized perceptual experiences subjects have or the so far uninterpreted sensory given, the data of sensation, sense data. A second, somewhat less restrictive genus of empiricist base vocabularies limits them to those that express secondary qualities, thought of as what's directly perceived in some less demanding sense. And a still more relaxed version of empiricism restricts its base vocabulary to the observational vocabulary deployed in non-inferentially elicited perceptual reports of observable states of affairs. Typical target vocabularies for the first phenomenalist class of empiricist-based vocabularies include those expressing empirical claims about how things really or objectively are. That is those expressing the applicability of any objective empirical concepts. Typical target vocabularies for secondary quality empiricism include any that specify primary qualities, or indeed the applicability of concepts that are not response dependent. And typical target vocabularies for observational vocabulary empiricism include theoretical vocabulary. All species of empiricism are concerned with the possibility of underwriting a semantics for the modal vocabulary used to express laws of nature, probabilistic vocabulary, normative vocabulary, and other sophisticated vocabularies of independent philosophical interest. The standard empiricist alternatives are either to show how a given problematic target vocabulary can be semantically elaborated from the favored empiricist base vocabulary on the one hand, or to show how to live with a local skepticism about its ultimate semantic intelligibility on the other hand. At the center of Seller's critique of empiricism in EPM is an argument against the weakest, least committive observational version of empiricism, a critique that then carries over mutatis mutandis to the more demanding versions. That argument depends on both his inferential functionalist semantics and on his pragmatism. Its fundamental strategy is to show that the proposed empiricist base vocabulary isn't pragmatically autonomous and hence not semantically autonomous. That is, he argues observational vocabulary isn't a vocabulary one could use though one used no other. Non-inferential reports of the results of observation don't form an autonomous stratum of language. In particular, he claims, when we look at what one must do to count as making a non-inferential report, 
we see that's not a kind of practice one could engage in, except in the context of inferential practices of using those observations as premises from which to draw inferential conclusions, as reasons for making judgments and undertaking commitments that are not themselves observations. The contribution to this argument of Seller's inferential functionalism about semantics lies in underwriting the claim that for any judgment, claim, or belief to be contentful in the way required for it to be cognitively, conceptually, or epistemically significant, for it to be even a potential bit of knowledge or evidence, to be a sapient state or status, it must be able to play a distinctive role in reasoning it must be able to serve as a reason for further judgments, claims, or belief, or beliefs, hence as a premise from which they can be inferred. That role in reasoning, in particular, what those judgments, claims, or beliefs can serve as reasons for, is an essential and not just an accidental component of them having the semantic content that they do. And that means that one cannot count as understanding, grasping, or applying concepts non-inferentially in observation, unless one can also deploy them at least as premises in inferences that conclusions do not, that do not, for that very reason, count as non-inferential applications of concepts, that is, as observational. Nor, for the same reason, can any discursive practice consist entirely of non-inferentially acquiring premises without any corresponding practice of drawing conclusions. So non-inferential observational uses of concepts <laughs> don't constitute an autonomous discursive practice, a language game one could play, though one played no other. And this conclusion about the pragmatic dependence of observational uses of vocabulary on inferential ones holds no matter what the subject matter of those observations is, whether it's observable features of the external environment, how things merely appear to the subject, or just the current contents of one's own mind. Here, the pragmatist concern with what one must do in order to be able to say or think something combines with semantic inferentialist functionalism about conceptual content to argue that the proposed empiricist base vocabulary is not pragmatically autonomous, since one must be able to make claims inferentially in order to count as making any of them non-inferentially that is observationally. If that's so, then potentially risky inferential moves can't be seen as an in principle optional superstructure erected on a semantically autonomous base of things directly known through observation, which is the empiricist picture. Although I think this is his most general and most powerful argument, Sellers doesn't limit himself to it in arguing against the substantially more committed forms of empiricism that insist on phenomenalist based vocabularies. In addition, he develops a constructive account of the relations between at least one principal species of phenomenalist vocabulary and objective vocabulary, relations that depend on pragmatic dependences between what one must do in order to deploy each kind of vocabulary to argue, once again, that the proposed empiricist base vocabulary does not form a semantically autonomous stratum of the language. This is his account of the relation between looks talk and is talk. It develops out of his positive account of what one must do in order to use vocabulary observationally. To apply the concept, say, green, non-inferentially, one must be able to do at least two sorts of things. First, one must be able reliably to respond differentially to the visible presence of green things. That's what blind and colorblind language users lack, but non-language using pigeons and parrots possess. Second, one must be able to exercise that capacity by reliably responding differentially to the visible presence of green things by applying the concept green. So one must possess grasp or understand that concept. Grasp of a concept is mastery of the use of a word, Sellers says. And his inferential functionalism dictates that this must include the inferential use of the word. 
knowing at least something about what follows from and is evidence for or against something's being green. This the blind or colorblind language user has and the pigeon and the parrot do not. Only the performances of the former can have the pragmatic significance of taking up a stance in the space of reasons, of committing themselves to something that has conceptual, that is inferentially articulated content. The point of Seller's parable of John in the tie shop is to persuade us that the home language game of the looks or seems vocabulary that expresses how things merely appear to us without undertaking any commitment to how they actually are is one that's pragmatically parasitic on the practice of making in principle risky reports of how things objectively are. For what one must do in order to count as saying how things merely look, Sellers claims, is to evince or express the reliable differential disposition to respond to something by claiming that it's green while actually withholding the endorsement of that claim because of one's collateral beliefs about the situation and one's lack of reliability in it. If that is what one's doing in making a looks claim, then one cannot be wrong about it in the same way one can be wrong about an is claim because one has withheld the principal commitment rather than undertaking it. And it follows that phenomenalist looks talk, which expresses how things merely appear without further commitment to how things actually are, isn't an autonomous discursive practice. It's not a language game one could play though one played no other. In fact, it's pragmatically parasitic on objective is talk. My point in rehearsing these famous arguments is to emphasize the role played by Seller's pragmatist emphasis on what one must be able to do in order to count as saying various kinds of things using vocabulary so as to express certain kinds of meanings, and by his inferentialist functionalist insistence that the role some vocabulary plays in reasoning makes an essential contribution to its semantic content. Although Sellers does not go on to make this argument, the way the two lines of thought conspire to undermine the semantic autonomy of candidate and Paris's base vocabularies provides a template for a parallel objection to secondary quality empiricism. For at least a necessary condition on anything's being a secondary quality concept is that it have an observational role that supports the introduction of corresponding looks talk. So that mastery of, of that looks talk can be taken to be essential to mastery of the concept. As looks green arguably is for the mastery of the concept green, but looks square is not for the mastery of the concept square. What would be needed to fill in the argument against secondary quality empiricism via the non-autonomy of its proposed base vocabulary would be an argument that nothing could count as mastering a vocabulary consisting entirely of expressions of this sort, apart from all inferential connections to primary quality concepts that did not have this structure. Well, so far, I've confined myself to offering a general characterization of the anti-empiricist arguments that appear in empiricism and the philosophy of mind. None of them involves empiricism's treatment of modality. Now I want to put those arguments in a somewhat different frame by conjoining them with one that's presented elsewhere and which does turn on the significance of modal concepts. The previous arguments concerned the suitability of some vocabulary to serve as the base vocabulary of an empiricist analysis. Since plausible motivations for caring about such an analysis typically require that it be semantically autonomous. This argument turns on the criteria of adequacy of the analysis itself. My remarks in this section concern Seller's arguments in his essay, Phenomenalism which can be regarded as a kind of companion piece to EPM. The first modal point is one that Sellers registers there, but doesn't linger on. His princi principal concern being rather with a second point concerning another aspect of the vocabulary in which phenomenalist analyses would have to be couched. But given my purposes here, I wanna make a bit more of the modal point than he does. The basic idea of a phenomenalist empiricist semantic analysis 
of ordinary objective vocabulary is that the expressive work done by talk of mind independent objects and their properties and relations can be done by talk of patterns in regularities of or generalizations concerning sense experiences characterized in a phenomenalist vocabulary. Saying that the curved red surface I'm experiencing is the experience of an apple that has parts that I'm not experiencing, a similarly bulgy red back and a white interior, for instance, is on this account properly understood as saying something about what I would experience if I turned it around or cut it open. That it continued to exist in the kitchen when I left the room is a matter of what I would have experienced had I returned. The first obvious observation is that an account of objective reality in terms of the powers of circumstances to produce or my dispositions to have sensations, experiences, beings appeared to, and so on, essentially involves modal concepts. The patterns, regularities, or generalizations in subjective appearances that are supposed to constitute objective realities are modally robust, counterfactual supporting patterns, regularities, or generalizations. Talk of what I actually do experience will not by itself underwrite claims about unexperienced spatial or temporal parts of empirical objects. 20th century logical empiricism promised to advance beyond traditional British empiricism because it could call on the full expressive resources of logical vocabulary to use as the glue sticking sensory experiences together so as to construct simulacra of external objects. But extensional logical vocabulary is not nearly expressively powerful enough for the phenomenalist version of the empiricist project. So for instance, the phenomenalist conditional terminating judgments into an infinite set of which C.I. Lewis proposes in his book, An Analysis of Knowledge and Valuation, to translate what he called the non-terminating judgments of ordinary objective empirical discourse, have to use his modal notion of strict or necessary implication. And similar points could be made about other phenomenalist reductionists, such as A.J. Ayer. The consequence of this observation, to which I want to draw attention, is that one cannot use such a strategy in one's phenomenalist empiricist analysis, translation or reduction of objective talk, and at the same time be a Humean skeptic about what modal vocabulary expresses. And that means that essential features of the only remotely plausible constructive strategy of phenomenalist empiricism are simply incompatible with the most prominent skeptical consequences about modal concepts that were characteristically drawn both by traditional and 20th century logicist empiricism. That skepticism about modality is what links Hume and Quine. This, I think, is a powerful argument. Seller's principal concern in his essay, Phenomenalism, however, is with a subsequent point. The conditionals codifying the patterns, regularities, or generalizations concerning sense experience that correspond to judgments about how things objectively are must not only be subjunctive, counterfactually robust conditionals, but in order to have any hope of being materially adequate, that is getting the truth conditions even approximately correct, their antecedents must themselves be expressed in objective vocabulary, not in phenomenalist vocabulary. What's true, at least true enough, is that if I were actually to turn the apple around and cut it open or return to its vicinity in the kitchen, I would have certain sense experiences. It's not in general true that if I merely seem to do those things, I'm guaranteed to have the corresponding experiences. For phrased in such phenomenalist terms, the antecedent of that conditional is satisfied in cases of imagination, visual illusion, dreaming, hallucination, and so on, that are precisely those not bound by the supposedly object-constituting rules and regularities. As Sellers summarizes the point, quote, to claim that the relationship between the framework of sense contents and that of physical objects can be construed on the phenomenalist model is to commit oneself to the idea that their inductively confirmable generalizations about sense contents 
which are in principle capable of being formulated without the use of the language of physical things. This idea is a mistake. It's a mistake, Sellers thinks, because, quote, the very selection of the complex patterns of actual sense contents in our past experiences, which are to serve as the antecedents of the generalizations in question, presuppose our common sense knowledge of ourselves as perceivers, of the specific physical environment in which we do our perceiving, and of the general principles which correlate the occurrence of sensations with bodily movements and environmental conditions. We select those patterns which go with our being in certain perceptual relation to a particular object of a certain quality, where we know that being in this relation to an object of that quality normally eventuates in our having the sense content referred to in the consequent. This argument then makes evident, quote, the logical dependence of the framework of private sense contents on the public intersubjective logical space of persons and physical things, end of the quote. So he's arguing the phenomenalist vocabulary is not autonomous. It's not a language game one can play though one plays no other. In particular, the uses of it that might plausibly fulfill many of the same pragmatic functions as ordinary objective empirical talk themselves presuppose the ability to deploy such objective vocabulary. As Sellers points out, the lessons learned from pressing on the phenomenalist version of empiricism apply more generally. In particular, they apply to more liberal versions of empiricism, whose base vocabulary is observational, including observations of enduring empirical objects, and whose target vocabulary is theoretical vocabulary. To begin with, if talk of theoretical entities is to be translated into or replaced by talk of patterns in, regularities of, or generalizations about observable entities, then they must be lawlike counterfactual supporting regularities and generalizations. They must permit inferences to what one would observe if one were to find oneself in specified circumstances or to prepare the apparatus in a certain way. For once again, the patterns, regularities, or generalizations about observations, the assertion of which an instrumentalist empiricist might with some initial plausibility take to have the same pragmatic effect as to be doing the same thing one is doing in deploying theoretical vocabulary must reach beyond the parochial, merely autobiographically significant contingencies of what subjects actually happen to observe. The theory is that the electrical currents cause magnetic fields regardless of the presence of suitable measuring devices. And that can only be made out in term, terms of what's observable that is, what could be observed, not just what is observed. And that's to say that the instrumentalist observational form of empiricism is also incompatible with Humean Quinean empiricist skepticism about the intelligibility of what's expressed by a lethic modal vocabulary. And an analog of the second argument against phenomenalist forms of empiricism also applies to the instrumentalist forms. For once again, the antecedents of the counterfactual conditionals specifying what could or would have been observed if certain conditions had obtained or certain operations were performed cannot themselves be formulated in purely observational terms. The meter needle would have been observably displaced if I'd connected the terminals of a volt ohmmeter to the wire, but that something is a volt ohmmeter is not itself a fact restatable in purely observational terms. Even leaving apart the fact that it's a functional characterization, not equivalent to any specification in purely physical terms, a description of the construction of some particular kind of volt ohmmeter is still going to help itself to notions such as being made of copper or being an electrical insulator, another bit of vocabulary that's both functional and theoretical. To satisfy the semantic ambitions of the instrumentalist, it's not enough to associate each theoretical claim with a set of jointly pragmatically equivalent counterfactual supporting conditionals whose consequence are couched wholly in observational vocabulary. All the theoretical terms appearing in the antecedents of those conditionals must be similarly replaced. No instrumentalist reduction of any actual theoretical claim has ever been suggested that even attempts to satisfy this condition. 
Though Sellers does not, and I will not, pursue the matter, one expects that corresponding arguments will go through mutatis mutandis also for the kind of empiricism that seeks to understand the use of primary quality vocabulary wholly in terms of the use of secondary quality vocabulary. What we mean by talk of primary qualities would have to be cashed out in terms of its powers to produce or our dispositions to perceive secondary qualities. That is, in terms of modally robust counterfactual supporting generalizations. And it'll be a challenge to specify the antecedents of a materially adequate set of such conditionals wholly in the official secondary quality vocabulary. Now the arguments I've considered so far set limits to the semantic ambitions of phenomenalist and instrumentalist forms of analytic empiricism. First, by focusing on the pragmatic preconditions of the required semantic autonomy of the proposed empiricist based vocabularies. And second, by looking in more detail at the specific sorts of inferential patterns in the base vocabulary, in terms of which it's proposed to reconstruct the circumstances and consequences of application of items in the various target vocabularies. Here it was observed that the material adequacy of such reconstructions seems to require the ineliminable involvement of terms from the target vocabulary, not only on the right side, but also on the left side of any such reconstruction in the definiens as well as in the definiendum. Modality plays a role in these arguments only because the material adequacy of the reconstruction also turns out to require appeal to counterfactually robust inferences in the base vocabulary. And insofar as that's so, the constructive semantic projects of the phenomenalist, instrumentalist, and secondary quality forms of empiricism are at odds with the local semantic skepticism about what's expressed by lethic modal vocabulary that's always been a characteristic cardinal critical consequence of empiricist approaches to semantics as epitomized for its traditional phase by Hume and for its logicist phase by Quine. In another massive pathbreaking essay of this period, Counterfactual, Counterfactuals, Dispositions, and the Causal Modalities, which he completed in 1957, Sellers argues directly against this empiricist treatment of modality, completing what then becomes visible as a two-pronged attack on the principal contentions and projects of empiricism, only the opening salvos of which were fired in empiricism in the philosophy of mind. His principal target here is, quote, the tendency to assimilate all discourse to describing, which he takes to be primarily, quote, responsible for the prevalence in the empiricist tradition of nothing but ism in all its various forms, emotivism, philosophical behaviorism, and phenomenalism, end of the quote. The form, Sellers, the form of nothing but ism that Sellers addresses in this essay is the Humean one that can find in statements of laws of nature expressed in a lethic modal vocabulary that lets us say what is and is not necessary and possible, nothing but expressions of matter of factual regularities or constant conjunctions. His arguments are directed against the view that holds modal vocabulary semantically unintelligible on grounds of inability to specify what one's saying about what the world is like how it's describing things as being, insofar as by using it, we're asserting something that goes beyond endorsing the existence of non-modally characterizable universal descriptive generalizations. Hume found that even his best understanding of actual observable empirical facts did not yet yield an understanding of rules or laws relating or otherwise governing them. Those facts didn't settle which of the things that actually happened had to happen, given others, that is, were at least conditionally necessary, and which of the things that did not happen nevertheless were possible in the sense that they were not ruled out by laws concerning what did happen. The issue here concerns the justifiability and intelligibility of a certain kind of inference, modally robust counterfactual supporting inferences of the kind made explicit by the use of modal vocabulary. Hume, 
and following him Quine, took it that epistemologically and semantically fastidious philosophers face a stark choice. Either show how to explain modal vocabulary, the circumstances of application that justify the distinctive counterfactual supporting inferential consequences of application in non-modal terms, or show how to live without it, to do what we need to do in science without making such arcane and occult super descriptive commitments. This demand was always the greatest source of tension between empiricism and naturalism, especially the scientific naturalism that Sellers elsewhere epitomized in the slogan, science is the measure of all things, of those that are that they are, and of those that are not that they are not. For modern mathematized natural science, shorn of concern with law, counterfactual, and dispositions, in short, of what is expressed by alethic modal vocabulary is less than an impotent Samson. It's an inert, unrecognizable, fragmentary remnant of a once vital enterprise. Seller's general recommendation for resolving this painful tension between empiricism and naturalism felt particularly acutely by and being one of the principal issues dividing the members of the Vienna Circle is to relax the exclusivism and rigorism that he traces to empiricism's semantic descriptivism. He says, once the tautology, the world is described by descriptive concepts, is freed from the idea that the business of all non-logical concepts is to describe, the way is clear to an ungrudging recognition that many expressions which empiricists have relegated to second-class citizenship in discourse are not inferior, they're just different. Sensit end of the quote. Sensitized as we now are by Seller's diagnosis of semantic autonomy claims as essential to various empiricist constructive and reconstructive projects, both in EPM and in the phenomenalism essay, and familiar as we now, now are with his criticisms of them, based on the inferentially articulated doings required to use or deploy various candidate base vocabularies, it should come as no surprise that his objections to critical empiricist suspicions of and hostility towards modality follow the same pattern. For the Humean Quinean empiricist semantic challenge to the legitimacy of modal vocabulary is predicated on the idea of an independently and antecedently intelligible stratum of empirical discourse it's purely descriptive and involves no modal commitments as a semantically autonomous background and model with which the credentials of modal discourse can then be invidiously compared. In this case, as in the others, the argument turns both on the pragmatism that looks to what one is doing in deploying the candidate base vocabulary, here purely descriptive vocabulary, and on the nature of the inferential articulation of that vocabulary necessary for such uses to play the expressive role characteristic of that vocabulary. The argument in this case is subtler and more complex than the others though. First, I take it that Sellers does not deny the intelligibility in principle of purely descriptive discourse that contains no explicitly modal vocabulary. Sellers is frustratingly but characteristically not explicit about his attitude toward the pragmatic autonomy in principle of such purely descriptive discourse. He says, quote, the idea that the world can in principle be so described that the description contains no modal expression is of a piece with the idea that the world can in principle be so described that the description contains no prescriptive expression. For what's being called to mind is the ideal of a statement of everything that is the case, which however serves through and through only the purpose of stating what is the case. And it's a logical truth that such a description, however many modal expressions might properly be used in arriving at it or justifying it, or in showing the relevance of one of its components to another, could contain no modal expression. The second reason the argument must be subtler here is that there are special difficulties involved in and corresponding delicacies required for working out the general pragmatist inferentialist strategy 
so as to apply it to this case by specifying the relation between the expressive role distinctive of modal vocabulary on the one hand and what one's doing, in particular the inferential commitments one is undertaking in using ordinary non-modal descriptive vocabulary itself on the other hand. The pragmatic dependency relation that lies at the base of Seller's argument is the fact that, quote, although describing and explaining are distinguishable, they're also in an important sense inseparable. It's only because the expressions in terms of which we describe objects, even such basic expressions as words for perceptible character characteristics of molar objects, locate those objects in a space of implications that they describe at all rather than merely label. The descriptive and explanatory resources of language advance hand in hand." End of the quote. Descriptive uses of vocabulary presuppose an inferentially articulated space of implications within which some descriptions show up as reasons for or explanations of others. Understanding those descriptions requires placing them in such a space. This pragmatist claim about what else one has to be able to do, namely infer, explain, treat one claim as a reason for another, in order for what one is doing to count as describing, connects to the use of modal vocabulary via the principle that, Seller says, quote, to make firsthand use of these modal expressions is to be about the business of explaining a state of affairs or justifying an assertion. End of the quote. That is, what one's doing in using modal expressions is explaining, justifying, or endorsing an inference. So what one is doing in saying that all A's are necessarily B's is endorsing the inference from anything's being an A to its being a B. The first sort of difficulty that I alluded to a moment ago stems from the fact that there are other ways of endorsing such a pattern of inference besides saying that all A's are necessarily B's. One's endorsement may, may be implicit in other things one does, the reasoning one engages in and approves of, rather than explicit in what one says. So from the fact, assuming as I shall that it is a fact, that the activity of describing is part of an indissoluble pragmatic package that includes endorsing inferences, and the fact that what one is doing in making a modal claim is endorsing an inference, it does not at all follow that there could be no use of descriptive vocabulary apart from the use of modal vocabulary. The second difficulty stems from the fact that although sellers may be right about what one's doing in making a modal claim, namely endorsing a pattern of inference, it's clear that one is not thereby saying that an inference is good. When I say pure copper necessarily conducts electricity and thereby unrestrictedly endorse inferences from anything's being copper to its conducting electricity, I've nevertheless said nothing about any inferences, explanations, justifications, or implications. And indeed, what I have said is something that could be true even if there'd never been any inferences or infers to endorse them, and hence no describers or discursive practitioners at all. Those two observations set the principal criteria of adequacy, both for Seller's positive working out of the pragmatist inferentialist treatment of modal vocabulary, and for his argument that the purely descriptive base vocabulary invoked by the empiricist critic of the semantic credentials of modal vocabulary lacks the sort of discursive autonomy the empiricist criticism presupposes and requires. Sellers carefully investigates the differences between and relations among three different possible analyses of the statement that A's are necessarily B's. Practical endorsement of the propriety of an inference from things being A to their being B. The explicit statement that one may infer the applicability of B from the applicability of A. And the statement that A physically entails B. The first is the sort of thing Sellers takes to be pragmatically presupposed by the activity of describing, that is by deploying descriptive vocabulary. The second fails to capture such practical endorsements 
because of the possibility of asserting such statements regarding the expressions A and B without understanding what they express. The virtue of statements like A physically entails B is that they do plausibly codify the practical endorsement of an inference that's implicit in what one does in the form of something one can explicitly say without bringing in irrelevant commitments concerning particular expressions, the activity of inferring or dis discursive practitioners. The remaining difficulty is that those statements seem plainly not to have the same content, not to say the same thing as explicitly modal statements of objective necessity. Seller's response to this problem is to acknowledge that modal statements do not say that some entailment holds, but to distinguish between what is said by using a bit of vocabulary and what is, as he says, contextually implied by doing so. Seller says very little about this latter notion, even though it bears the full weight of his proposed emendation of the rationalist account. It's recognizably the same distinction he'd appealed to earlier in inference and meaning as the distinction between what one says by making a statement and what one thereby conveys. There, his example is that in asserting the sky is clear today, I say that the sky is clear today, but convey that I believe that the sky is clear. That otherwise uninterpreted example suggests to me that what Sellers has in mind is the distinction between semantic and pragmatic inferences. That's the distinction between inferences underwritten by the contents of what's said or asserted on the one hand, and inferences underwritten by what one is doing in saying them on the other. The inference from the sky is clear to it is not raining is of the first sort. The inference from my asserting the sky is clear to Brandon believes the sky is clear is of the second sort. Inferences of the two kinds may generally be distinguished by the frege geech embedding test. Look to see whether those who make the inference in question also endorse the corresponding conditional. If the sky is clear, then it's not raining is generally true. Well, if the sky is clear, then Brandon believes it's clear is not generally true. If that is in fact the distinction Sellers is after, then it seems to me the view that he's expounding and defending can be put less paradoxically if we don't take a detour through entailment statements, but concern ourselves directly with the relation between the endorsement of patterns of inference and modal statements. The underlying rationalist insight is a pragmatist inferentialist one. What one is doing in making a modal claim is endorsing a pattern of inference. Modal vocabulary makes possible new kinds of sayings that have the pragmatic effect of endorsing inferences. To say that is not yet to say what they say. It's only to say what one is doing by saying them. But it does settle the pragmatic significance of such modal claims in the sense of their appropriate circumstances and consequences of application. If one practically endorses the pattern of inference that treats classifying or describing anything at all as an A, as sufficient grounds, all on its own, as Sellers says, for concluding that it's a B, then one is committed to the claim that all A's are necessarily B's. And commitment to that claim is commitment to practically ratify that pattern of inference. Assuming, as Sellers has claimed, that using ordinary non-modal descriptive vocabulary requires practically endorsing such patterns of inference, what he calls situating descriptions in a space of implications, anyone who has the practical ability to deploy purely descriptive vocabulary already knows how to do everything he needs to know how to do to deploy modal vocabulary as well. He need not actually do so, since practically undertaking those inferential commitments does not require that one have available a language with vocabulary permitting one to do that by saying something. But all such a practitioner lacks in such circumstances is the words to hook up to discriminative and responsive abilities he already possesses. In this precise sense, the ability to deploy modal vocabulary is practically implicit in the ability to deploy non-modal descriptive vocabulary. 
Sellers has claimed that the activity of describing is unintelligible, except as part of a pragmatic package that includes not only the making of inferences, but the making of counterfactually robust inferences, the sort of inferences involved in explanation and licensed by explicitly modal statements of laws. He sums up the claim admirably in the title of another of his earliest papers, Concepts as Involving Laws and Inconceivable Without Them. Grasp of a concept is mastery of the use of a word, Sellers says. And for descriptive concepts, that use includes not only sorting inferences, however fallibly and incompletely, into materially good and materially bad ones, but also among the ones one takes to be materially good to distinguish, however fallibly and incompletely, between counterfactual circumstances under which they do and counterfactual circumstances under which they do not remain good. Part of taking an inference to be materially good is having a view about which possible additional collateral premises or auxiliary hypotheses would and which would not infirm it. Chestnut trees produce chestnuts unless they're immature or blighted. Dry, well-made matches strike unless there's no oxygen. The hungry lioness would still chase the antelope if it were Tuesday or the beetle on the distant tree crawled slightly further up the branch but not if the lioness's heart were to stop beating. The point is not that there's any particular set of such subjunctive discriminations that one must be able to make in order to count as deploying the concepts involved. It's that if one can make no such practical assessments of the counterfactual robustness of material inferences involving those concepts, one could not count as having mastered them. Against the background of this pragmatist inferentialist claim, about what's involved in the ordinary descriptive use of concepts, Sellers' claim, as I'm reading him, is that explicitly modal law-like statements are statements that one is committed or entitled to whenever one is committed or entitled to endorse such patterns of counterfactually robust inference and commitment or entitlement to which in their turn commit or entitle one to the corresponding patterns of inference. Saying that about them settles what one needs to do to use such modal statements. And it does not say how one is thereby describing the world as being when one does. It does not, in particular, describe a pattern of inference as good, though saying that does, in its own distinctive way, express endorsement of such a pattern. It does not do those things for the simple reason that the use of modal expressions is not, in the first instance, descriptive. It codifies explicitly in the form of a statement, a feature of the use of descriptive expressions that's indissolubly bound up with, but not identical to their descriptive use. Nonetheless, in knowing how to use vocabulary descriptively, one knows how to do everything one needs to know how to do in order to use modal vocabulary. And that's enough to show that one cannot actually be in the Humean predicament presupposed by the empiricist challenge to the intelligibility of modal vocabulary. For one cannot know how to use vocabulary in matter of factual descriptions, the cat is on the mat, and not have any grip on how to use modal, counterfactual, and dispositional vocabulary. It's necessary for live cats to breathe. The cat could still be on the mat if the mat were a slightly different shade of blue, but not if it turned into soup. The cat would probably leave the mat if she saw a mouse. Although explicitly modal vocabulary is an in principle optional superstructure on practices of deploying descriptive vocabulary, what it expresses cannot be mysterious in principle to those who can engage in those base level practices. In taking this line, Sellers quite properly sees himself as reviving a central idea of Kant's. The ability to use empirical descriptive terms such as mass, rigid, and green already presupposes grasp of the kind of properties and relations made explicit by modal vocabulary. It's this insight that leads Kant to the idea of pure concepts or categories, including the alethic modal concepts of necessity and possibility that articulate causal laws, which must be available a priori because, and in the sense that, the ability to deploy them is presupposed by the ability to deploy ordinary empirical descriptive concepts. 
The categories, including modality, are concepts that, are, that make explicit what's implicit in the empirical descriptive use of any concepts at all. The, the details of which laws, the statements of which express counterfactually robust patterns of inference actually obtain, although those details are empirical, an empirical matter, that empirical descriptions are related by rules in the form of laws which do support counterfactually robust inferences is not itself an empirical matter. It's a truth about the framework of empirical description. I want to call the underlying insight the Kant Sellers thesis about modality. It's the claim that in being able to use non-modal empirical descriptive vocabulary, one already knows how to do everything one needs to know how to do in order to deploy modal vocabulary, which accordingly can be understood as making explicit structural features that are always already implicit in what one does in describing. Articulating and justifying his version of the Kant Sellers thesis about modality is Sellers's constructive response to the empiricist tradition's nothing butism about modality. It's demand that what's expressed by modal claims either be shown to be expressible in non-modal terms or be dispensed with entirely by semantically fastidious philosophers and scientists. This complements and completes his demonstration in the phenomenalism essay that this critical consequence of an overambitious empiricism is in any case incompatible with any constructive empiricist effort to reconstruct or replace the use of target vocabularies, such as objective descriptive vocabulary, primary quality vocabulary, and theoretical vocabulary, in terms of the favorite empiricist base vocabularies, if that effort is subject to even the most minimal criteria of material adequacy. Together, those arguments show what Sellers eventually made of his early intuition that the soft underbelly of empiricism in both its traditional and its 20th century logistical form is in its semantic treatment of modality. My overall aim in this talk has been to place the arguments against empiricism presented in the first half of empiricism and the philosophy of mind in the larger context opened up by laying them alongside the further battery of arguments aimed at the same target that derive from consideration of that tradition's views about modality. And I've been concerned to show that the methodological strategies that guide all of these discussions are Sellers' pragmatist insistence on looking at what one must be able to do in order to employ empirical descriptive vocabulary, and his rationalist commitment to the necessary inferential articulation of the concepts expressed by the use of such vocabulary. I think that even more than 50 years on, there's still a lot of juice to be squeezed out of those ideas. But I wanna close with another, maybe more frivolous suggestion. Every sufficiently engaged reading becomes a rewriting. And I've been offering here, inter alia, the outline of a different narrative strategy that Sellers could have adopted in the late 1950s. Under some such title as The Limits of Empiricism, he could have represented the material that in fact appeared first as roughly the first half of empiricism and philosophy of mind, and the second halves of each of phenomenalism and counterfactuals dispositions and causal modalities, organized around and introduced in terms of the themes I've traced here. And I think it's interesting to speculate about how his reception might have been different and about where we would find ourselves today had this been the shape of Seller's first book. Thank you. All right, let's uh, thank Professor Brandon for this great talk. Um, well, I think we have enough time, I mean, uh, more than enough time for questions and answers. So you can ask questions in the usual Zoom manner by raising your virtual hand. I see here. Uh, Yako R the, and Jenny Hung. Um, we can begin with Yako and then Jenny. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> uh, so my question concerns the sort of what's left about the classic Humean skepticism about modal vocabulary after the counselor's argument runs its course. So assuming that the argument is good, uh, I wonder if the Humean skepticism is um, demolished, at, demolished as a whole, because even though the argument, counselor's argument shows that um, Humean doubt leads to a pragmatic self-contradiction so that one cannot be in the position to doubt model vocabulary as good or legitimate if one can describe something empirical at all. It does still, it does not follow that um, all model claims would be vindicated or that there would be any true model claims because it, because simply because, so because from the claim that uh, one cannot be in a position to doubt model vocabulary if we if one can use already empirical descriptive vocabulary it does follow from that claim that all model claims or at least some model claims are true or um, they are justified so what do you think are the sort of broader consequences for human skepticism after the counselor's sort of transcendental argument runs its course Okay, good. Uh, uh, I think you point to, to the need to the need for an important distinction in uh, uh, thinking about, as you say, sort of what's left uh, uh, of a human skepticism about uh, modality. Uh, what I think is demolished is the idea that you could take uh, the use of ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary to be entirely in order in the sense that some of those claims, uh, that some of those claims are uh, uh, con determinately contentful and are true, uh, but claim that that's not so of any modal claim. Uh, it's the differential uh, attitude toward uh, the determinate contentfulness and truth of uh, some descriptive vocabulary and the denial of that claim for all modal vocabulary that I think is shown to be untenable uh, by this uh, argument. Uh, because the determinate contentfulness of uh, ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary is articulated by subjunctively robust relations uh, among them. Now, we could be wrong about any particular modal claim we make, any particular subjunctively robust uh, and therefore explanation supporting inference from descriptive vocabulary to descriptive vocabulary, from descriptive claim to descriptive claim that we make, as we could be mistaken about the determinate contentfulness or truth of any descriptive claim. But if any descriptive claims are determinately contentful and true, some modal claims must be uh, as well, because that's presupposed by the determinate contentfulness and truth of the uh, determinately contentful claims. And that's not a fact about us and our pragmatic um, uh, self-contradiction. Uh, that's about that's a semantic claim about what's said by descriptive vocabulary and modal vocabulary. Where the sort of pragmatism comes in is in saying that we can read off uh, relations of conceptual dependence, uh, conceptual presupposition from pragmatic presuppositions about the use of expression. Uh, but the claim that he's justifying is a claim about uh, the determinate contentfulness and truth of descriptive claims presupposing the determinate contentfulness and truth of modal claims. So the descriptive claims could not be determinately contentful and true unless some modal claims were determinately contentful and true. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Jenny. 
Yeah, thanks so much for Professor Brendam's wonderful talk. Um, I actually have two questions, but I think they're related. The first is about um, Sellers' claim that phenomenalist vocabulary is not autonomous. And I was wondering if my understanding is on the right track. So my thought is that, so there are meanings of each of the terms, for example, pain or seeing something red or whatever. And the definition of the concepts are kind of um, partially defined in certain modal concepts. For example, you have raised uh, some example here talking about greenness or you know, today you see something. So can I say the, def the very definition of red or green or, or you know, all these phenomenal concepts, phenom phenomenal vocabularies are partially defined in terms of modal concepts? This is my first question. And for the second question, I think about how we understand the functional characterization of terms. So can I say I have a set of function? Um, so that is based on my experience, my behaviors, etc. And you also have a different set of functions when you use your terms. So there is a slight difference between my use of terms and your use of terms and a blind person's use of terms. For example, we both use the word red, but actually the function are different. Can I say something like that? I, I, so, or yeah. it is a public kind of function? Okay, well, I, I, I see these are uh, related questions. Uh, so uh, yes, the thought is that uh, those subjunctively robust inferential relations among concepts are partly constitutive of their concept uh, of their content. Uh, whether terms actually have definitions or not, uh, that that's sort of a separate question. But it's it's part of their content. It's an aspect of their content which is not to say that there needs to be some subset such that if we didn't have that, it would be a different concept. It can be a more complex structure than that, but uh, the content of non-logical descriptive concepts is articulated in part by these subjunctively robust uh, inferential connections uh, among them. Now you say, well, but you're going to endorse some slightly different ones than I do, uh, maybe not so much for green, though even there, you know, you've seen some green things that I haven't seen. And so, uh, you know, we're gonna reason differently about those things uh, than I would. Does that mean that we don't share uh, a concept? And here uh, it's important that Sellers is, uh, you know, the great Kantian of his, uh, generation. And he thinks of the shared concepts as a matter of our binding ourselves by the same norms. Uh, this for, for Kant is binding ourselves by the same rules that are the concepts that determine what else you're committing yourself to by saying it's green or it's square or uh, whatever. So you and I might have different conceptions in that we uh, are disposed to make different uh, inferences, but because we're playing counters in this public game, uh, when you say the coin is copper and I say the coin is copper, even if we have different views about what follows uh, uh, as to what its melting point is, we still, by playing that public uh, counter, have bound ourselves by the norms of the concept copper uh, that uh, say that the melting point, it follows that the melting point is a certain thing that it, if it's copper, it will conduct electricity and so on. So it's not a matter of our grip on these concepts, but in the Kantian picture of their grip on us, what norms have we made ourselves subject to? Norms uh, that set standards for the assessment of the correctness of what we've said. Uh, and I and the colorblind person can have bound ourselves by the same norms for using green. You and I who disagree about the melting point uh, of copper can still have bound ourselves by the same norms and so be using the same uh, concepts. 
Great, right. thank you very much for the question. Um, do we have further questions? You can do so by raise your hand. Ah, Stefan, okay. Uh, perfect, and Ben as well. Oh, first give the word to Stefan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Brandon, for this wonderful talk and the connections you made within Celeris's work. I think I have two issues. Um, the one is just with regard to the Kant Sellers line on modality. I think the argumentation is really very strong if you take it structurally. But as you know, Hume and in certain sense also Quine, they were much more genetical thinkers uh, in, the in, in the sense of more or less looking at, let's say, metaphorically, a child. How, the, how, how does a child learn concepts to use and to apply and so on? And if you take it genetically, then the plausibility of arguing that the use of a descriptive vocabulary presupposes implicitly or explicitly the use of, mod of modal concepts is um, less convincing. So I was just wondering how such a classical associationist empiricist reaction would be countered by the structural arguments you have given us. And the second aspect, mm -hmm. I would, there's just a kind of um, general question with regard to the pragmatic inferentialist um, theory and the Gricean speech act theory. So the, the connection between at the one hand Austin and Grice's uh, inferentialism, so to speak. What kind of connections are there between what you're interested in and what they were interested in? Okay, good. Uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, Sellers is gonna take issue with in empiricism is what seems to him as a Kantian, a slide from uh, genetic considerations to justificatory ones. As the conclusion that uh, Hume wants to come to, that Quine wants to come to is, we're not justified in using these concepts. Uh, and uh, Sellers endorses you know, Hume's criticism of say Locke as having produced a mere physiology of the understanding rather than an epistemology that would tell us about what's justified. Uh, so he's not going to accept a reduction of uh, epistemic questions of justification to genetic questions of uh, acquisition. But uh, on the side of acquisition, Sellers, uh, in one of the passages uh, I quoted, says that it's only insofar as observational terms are situated in a space of implications that they describe rather than merely label. So if he's seeing the child learning color terminology, uh, the child learns the differential responsive dispositions, learns to respond to this by saying purple and to this by saying yellow. Those are so far just labels. The associations that the empiricists start with are just labels. To acquire the concept uh, green involves knowing things like if it's green, it's not red. Uh, if it's green, it's colored. Uh, that saying that something is square doesn't settle whether it's green or red. That is, you, uh, in order to, to grasp the concept as a description of something, Sellers thinks, uh, you have to not only be able to respond differentially by labeling things with this, but uh, you have to know what follows from applying a certain label, at least some things that uh, follow from it. And his claim, and it, it, it's a substantive uh, claim, is that knowing what uh, follows is a matter of endorsing subjunctively robust inferences. That uh, if uh, uh, the frog is, if the frog is on the log and it jumps, then it won't be uh, on the log. Or, you know, if the frog is struck by lightning, then uh, it won't be uh, on the log. That uh, describing involves not just uh, uh, 
capacities that look upstream, uh, letting you respond by labeling, but also knowing what, you're, what you would be committing yourself to by uh, applying them. And that's where the uh, Kant Seller's thesis uh, gets its grip. I would add also, excuse me to uh, a little bit, mm -hmm. Uh, to, okay, because okay. I'm, I'm in my head, I have the, the necessity and mo the possibility structure. I can understand by differentiation, and you say, well, if, if you, you need to differentiate between green and red. These are very factual situations, and maybe the child has been confronted with other colors the day before, and so on. But of course, the the modal concepts are stronger than these purely empirically uh, stimuli which are uh, in which you can read a, different, a difference. So could the same, same structure by distinguishing labeling and conceptualizing, could that be also be applicable for the more uh, robuster notions like necessity and uh, possibility? Well, the claim is that concept, modal concepts like necessity and possibility make explicit the uh, force of the implications that relate merely descriptive, merely descriptive concepts. So, you know, for me to have uh, the concept of a lion, I have to have at least some, uh, there have to be at least some inferences that I can make about what lions would do under certain circumstances. You know, a hungry lion would chase the gazelle, uh, would not if it were struck uh, by lightning, Oh, uh, uh, and so on. That 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 those uh, implications are an essential part of uh, what grasping the empirical concept of a lion uh, is. Okay. I mean, your second uh, question about Grice, uh, Sellers is committed to these semantic categories. Uh, coming to apply to intentional states and to public discourse sort of simultaneously. So uh, he resists a Gricean picture according to which we should understand the semantics of public discourse uh, as reflecting an antecedent, uh, antecedent and autonomous possession of semantic content by beliefs and intentions that could get uh, the story about non-natural meaning uh, uh, in Grice going. Uh, our uh, internal states uh, acquire the, the discursive content believing that things are thus and so as part of the same process by which we come into the language and learn the, the public ones. So uh, Sellers is gonna strenuously resist uh, an account that sees the semantic contentfulness as flowing in either direction from the uh, uh, intentional states out to the public discourse, or in fact, the other way, uh, the other way around. Thank you. Right, uh, thank you very much. Um, next question is from Ben Wielebort. Hello, uh, thank you, Professor Brandom, for your wonderful talk. Um, I had, a, uh, I think, a more general question. Um, I was wondering what uh, is your view on the importance of Sellers' critique on, uh, of, of empiricism for the, the practice and the presentation of science? Because uh, you know most scientists today are still convinced empiricists. Uh, empiricism is, of course, not only a philosophy about semantics. Um, and well, I think that most scientists would probably not see the importance of uh, the importance of or, or the added value of a more Kantian view on, on science. Um, and so I was wondering whether you could elaborate on that. I mean, as I said at the uh, very beginning, uh, Sellers never wavered in accepting what we might call minimal empiricism. Uh, the view that uh, non-inferential observational, non-inferentially elicited observational reports uh, 
play a very distinctive role in the justification of empirical knowledge claims. They're something like the ultimate court of appeal for uh, justification of empirical claims. Uh, he would claim that minimal empiricism, uh, absolutely everyone has accepted uh, as they ought. Uh, that was never at, at issue between empiricists and rationalists, uh, uh, say. Uh, what he's taking issue with is this stronger program of uh, claiming that uh, for any potentially problematic set of concepts, uh, intentional concepts like belief, uh, normative concepts, uh, probabilistic concepts, that either one must be able to translate those concepts into observational or phenomenalist, you know, whatever your base empiricist vocabulary is, into some minimal vocabulary. Either you must be able to translate them into that vocabulary or they're in principle defective and you have to learn how to do what you're doing without them. That uh, empiricist project, he thinks is broken backed. Uh, that project of traditional empiricism and uh, though it was given you know, new life in uh, uh, the first half of the 20th century in the form of logical empiricism, that's broken backed uh, too. And that project is no part of sort of the working scientists uh, uh, commitment. It's the minimal empiricism that they uh, care about. Now, uh, where the Kantian uh, uh, innovation, I think, matters in our thinking about uh, science, about knowledge generally, is uh, first of all, in having a conception of concepts as rules for inferring, uh, rules that we bind ourselves by uh, when we commit ourselves to empirical claims, when I uh, play the counter copper, uh, use that English word, uh, to say it expresses a concept is to talk about the broadly inferential norms that I've bound myself by uh, in uh, applying it. And that conception of concepts is very important in uh, cognitive science. Uh, I have a paper called uh, How Analytic Philosophy Has Failed Cognitive Science. Uh, and uh, one of the ways I think it's failed is not putting this Kantian picture of concepts uh, in place of uh, a thoughtless empiricist conception of concepts as something like Boolean combinations of phenomenal features, uh, which for the sorts of reasons that uh, these Solarsian arguments uh, articulate is completely inadequate to uh, uh, real concepts. But one of Kant's axial ideas is he really discovered, I want to say, that in addition to concepts whose expressive job it is, uh, whose functional task it is to describe and explain the empirical goings on uh, in our surroundings, uh, in addition to concepts with that expressive job, there are other concepts whose distinctive expressive task it is to make explicit features of the framework of describing and explaining, uh, the framework of practical activities on the part of uh, discursive practitioners that make describing and explaining empirical goings on possible. And Kant's idea that uh, the idea of lawfulness, uh, the idea of uh, inf inferences and implications as coming with uh, 
ranges of subjunctive robustness. Uh, and that as an essential framework uh, feature of uh, empirical description that uh, it's essential to the descriptive empirical content of concepts uh, that they stand in uh, implication relations that support subjunctive reasoning, reasoning about what would happen if things were somewhat different uh, than they are now. Uh, that's the kind of inference that makes explanation possible. And in seeing that as uh, Sellers puts it in one of the passages uh, I quoted, that though description and explanation are different, uh, they mutually presuppose one another. There's no description without the possibility of uh, explanation. And that I think was a deep uh, insight of Kant's. The apparatus of pure concepts of the understanding, the categories and so on, the, elabor the way he elaborated the idea has some Baroque features and that's not the only way we can elaborate those ideas. And I see Sellers is helping us sort of bring them down uh, uh, to earth from the transcendental heights that Kant had put them in. But, you know, this was a big discovery of his and yeah, he got excited <laughs> by it. Um, and, um, uh, but, but I do think that there's a real insight uh, there for us, you know, thinking Sellers identified himself principally as a philosopher of science uh, and was trying to bring, again, as he said, analytic philosophy from its Humean empiricist reductive phase into its Kantian phase where it recognized these, these insights. Rorty in his introduction to my edition of Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind uh, characterizes my aspiration as bringing analytic philosophy, ushering analytic philosophy from its incipient Kantian phase into its eventual Hegelian phase. And uh, there, there's a certain justice to that, uh, uh, to that characterization. All right, uh, thank you very much. I see that Yako has another question, but if I may so, be so rude myself to ask a question that I really wanted to ask. Um, so yeah, I really like obviously the, the talk. Uh, my question concerns an aspect of Sellers' uh, philosophy of modality that you do not, as far as I know, focus on elaborately. And this aspect is this analysis of modal claims in terms of possible worlds or histories as he, for example, develops in his 1948 concepts as involving laws and inconceivable without them. So on page 293 until page 295, it develops this little formal system. Um, and he justifies the need for such a possible world analysis um, because he thinks that this framework is necessary to be able to express the difference between statements of natural necessity, real connections on the one hand, and then universal truths that are merely accidentally true on the other hand. Um, now, what is interesting about that, and um, that he does not actually, because it's, it's in his very early 1948 paper, but he doesn't abandon talk about possible worlds in his subsequent work. So, for example, in his 1949 paper, Language Rules and Behavior, he writes, I quote, I shall insist that it, it is just as legitimate and indeed necessary for the philosopher to speak of real connections as this to speak of universal um, propositions and possible worlds. Another example is his uh, 1952 paper, Particulars, where he writes, quote, now we're all familiar with the Leibnizian manner of explicating the laws of logic in terms of possible worlds. Can this same device be used to clarify the difference between laws of logic and laws of nature? Not only can it be done, but it's extremely useful, uh, helpful to do so, particularly in dealing with the problem we have in mind. Um, this is from 1952, but, and then the last example is from 1958, his article, Meditation Leibnizienne, uh, which is published in 1965, um, but it was a lecture from 1958, uh, and it gives a fictionalist account of possible worlds at the end of this article. So he summarizes this as follows, so I quote, thus to imagine a possible but not actual world is to place discourse, which if seriously intended would purport to describe this world in a rubric which marks it as fiction. Um, now I, I think this possible worlds analysis in Sellers is interesting because 
um, you really focus on the pragmatics, I think, of, of model claims, and you're also right. So in the 2015 book, uh, I quote uh, you, this is page 190, uh, you say sellers end up saying nothing at all about what one says in making first-hand use of modal vocabulary properly understood. I think this is not a semantic expressivism about analytic modal uh, vocabulary, but a kind of pragmatic expressivism about it. Um, so here I agree with your interpretation, of course, that the account in terms of rules of inference touches upon the pragmatics of making modal statements. But I think there is also this semantic story that Seller tells, uh, and one that is actually in terms of truth relative to a possible world or history. Um, so on the other hand, Sellers himself is, is not really clear about the relation between both, um, but therefore my question, um, how do you relate these two analyses in, um, in Sellers? Um, I, I do agree, of course, that the regularist account is much more prominent, but there's also this possible roles account. And I was just wondering, what you thought about the connection uh, in sellers between the two. Okay, well, that's a very good question and uh, uh, well put. Uh, I would mention uh, his long difficult essay, Time in the World Order, as uh, a place where he makes maybe the most substantive use of uh, the possible worlds uh, framework. Um, it's uh, not much read, but uh, Pedro Amaral is going to do a, an edition of it with an interpretation. He sees it as absolutely central uh, uh, to sellers. And you're right that uh, uh, my claim that one should understand uh, sellers account of modality as uh, couched in a pragmatic meta vocabulary rather than a semantic meta vocabulary. That is, that he gives us a way to say what we're doing in using modal vocabulary, rather than an account of what we're saying uh, when we do. Uh, you're right, both that that's uh, a characterization of what I'm extracting from uh, uh, his writing on modality, particularly looking at uh, the counterfactuals um, uh, dispositions in the causal modalities paper, uh, which is the principal place where he takes that as his topic. But you're you're right that what I said there is not uh, true if we look over the whole of Sellers' corpus, that he has uh, ideas anyway about what's said semantically uh, by them uh, in terms of possible worlds uh, and his early, uh, the editor of the first collection of his early papers called that collection uh, Pure Pragmatics and Possible Worlds uh, to emphasize that these two ideas uh, were both in play. Uh, and I think with a little bit of a tweak to the later Possible Worlds uh, uh, enthusiasts who did not appreciate that uh, by contrast to uh, Quine of sort of influential philosophers of uh, the 1950s, uh, Sellers was both uh, anticipating putting modality at the center of philosophy, um, uh, appreciated the central importance of modality for philosophical concerns in a way the empiricists didn't, and even invoked this uh, apparatus. Uh, so, so this is right. Uh, I think it's striking that uh, after this 1957 essay, Sellers never wrote another piece that was explicitly devoted to modality. And I think one of the reasons is that he did not know how to unify uh, the possible world's thought with this uh, pragmatic metalinguistic uh, analysis. Uh, whether he worked on it or not, I don't know, but we, we, we don't have anything uh, uh, later uh, about it. Uh, 
you mentioned correctly that uh, his thought was that uh, we needed an explication of the sense of necessity that's expressed by statements of natural law. Uh, and in cases, uh, I mean, Sellers mostly uh, had what seems to us now an old fashioned uh, sort of covering law view of modality that uh, behind every true subjunctive conditional, there was a universal law, which is something that you know, philosophers of science would not uh, insist on now and in general our use of modality. Uh, uh, we would not, but, but he realized that he needed an explication of uh, that particular sense of uh, modality, what gets expressed by P rules in Carnap, which is quite distinct from logical uh, modalities or metaphysical uh, modalities. Uh, now, the uh, modal revolution of uh, the late 60s and early 70s was, to begin with, interested in logical modalities, Kripke's uh, uh, soundness and completeness results for the Lewis uh, systems, and then advanced to uh, thinking of semantics in terms of metaphysical modalities and has never taken very seriously the sense of necessary that uh, Sellers was interested in. Uh, that was what he thought the notion of possible worlds was good for, not uh, precisely to contrast that with either logical modality or uh, metaphysical uh, modality. And that's a strain of thought that, that I think you know, has not been further developed in Sellers. As I say, he didn't quite know how to make it uh, work. And uh, that has not been a prominent feature of discussions of possible worlds uh, since then. I think that's an unexplored, uh, a still largely unexplored terrain. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, we have a further question from Iaku. So if other people want to raise a uh, question, they can just do so in the usual manner. Yeah. Yes. Um, so one of Kant's problems with the categories or with frameworks concerned the universality. And uh, this was a problem, especially for the Neo-Kantians. Uh, so I was wondering if the same over spills over, spills over to Sellers' account of the framework or expressive nature of modality. So is it universal for all rational beings or only for humans in certain time and place? Or it, it, does he have an answer or do you have an answer to this sort of scope problem of the framework account? Well, it's a very good uh, question. And I think one of the uh, big divides in contemporary philosophy is between roughly Kantians and Aristotelians, uh, Kantians who aspire to uh, describe the framework that would be presupposed by all rational beings. Uh, and Aristotelians looking only for us in a much more biologically uh, circumscribed sense. Uh, and that distinction is clearest in practical philosophy and thinking about morality, whether uh, moral laws would hold for uh, rational spiders or whether morality is human uh, morality as uh, Aristotelians uh, would claim. Uh, but uh, on the issue of sort of discursiveness as such, uh, Sellers clearly aspired to uh, a Kantian account uh, that, that would uh, apply to anything that could make judgments, has to make 
inferences, uh, those inferences have to articulate the um, uh, contents of non-logical concepts. So they have to be material, uh, materially good inferences. And at least some of them have to be subjunctively robust. These he would claim are uh, non-negotiable conditions of discursiveness to core, nothing to do with our uh, embodiment or even with our finitude uh, you know, insofar as we can um, make sense of counterfactuals that um, you know, consider beings who are really quite uh, uh, unlike us. Uh, Sellers seems to think that uh, using a subject predicate structure, uh, having singular terms uh, is part of this um, uh, universal, uh, rationally universal structure. Uh, he is in uh, important ways, and this is not a, he is a nominalist, um, uh, in this regard, that thinks that uh, being able to pick out objects with terms is a fundamental uh, uh, rational capacity. This is not a side of him that I'm enthusiastic about uh, or sort of see the prospects uh, of in the way that I think the inferential articulation is, uh, that's an idea I can see how to do something with the nominalist idea, uh, much less so. But clearly the aspiration is the Kantian one uh, to find some structures for all uh, rational beings. Uh, the place where uh, Sellers addresses the issues of space and time, I mean, it was the, uh, it wasn't the, transcendental analytic that gave the neo-Kantians fits. It was the transcendental aesthetic that was the, the problem. And uh, the place where Sellers discusses that is uh, in the opening chapters of Science and Metaphysics of his Locke lectures. Uh, and I want to say that everything we understand about that, we understand from John McDowell's Woodbridge lectures uh, but they are almost as difficult to understand as the original is. I'm told that when Akhil Bilgrami asked, invited John to, to give the Woodbridge Lectures at Columbia uh, and asked him if he had any idea what he'd talk about, uh, and McDowell said, well, he thought he would talk about the first chapter of Seller's Science and Metaphysics, that Akhil Bilgrami said, I'm so glad you told me that. I'll book a much smaller room. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yako, for second question. Um, well, we're already going on for quite a while, but if anyone wants to ask a last question, it's absolutely the time to do so now. And otherwise, I can already, uh, for those who haven't uh, registered yet for the public lecture, which already starts in one hour at 5 p.m. Uh, Belgian time, um, you can still register. Um, also for tomorrow, the logic seminar, uh, it's still possible to, to register uh, on the website. And then you will get a link, uh, a Zoom link in your mailbox. Um, all right, then I, let's thank uh, Professor Brandon uh, once again um, for this great talk and Q&A session. And then we see each other at 5 uh, p.m. Uh, for the public lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.